Alright guys, we are finally at the end of Trauma, Chapter 11, and that's our, we're going to talk about some of the special considerations of Trauma that we need to start thinking about. Now that we've gone all over the major systems here, let's put it all together. Let's, let's figure out how we want to do this, okay? So, there's a lot of lives that are lost to Trauma every year, uh, most of which are young active members of society, which is why there's been a lot of focus on trauma and trauma care. And uh, again, motor vehicle crashes was kind of the whole reason EMS was started, was we were losing a lot of patients to that, to automobile crashes. And um, there's been a lot of, of advances in car technology, EMS technology for that matter. Um, so uh, injury prevention, I think, is something that we don't do enough of if we could prevent a lot of these things from happening uh you'd be surprised uh you know you, we're the only business that i know that wants to put ourselves out of business um so again local ems personnel provide voluntary home inspections this is a new program that, that, that some systems are doing uh fire and again remember that these are voluntary things uh, you're there to help people to, to to spot obvious hazards okay um so Concentrating on on your vehicle highway safety, uh, pediatric seats, uh, males 13 to 35 year olds, uh, and, and explaining to them the, the how trauma can negatively affect them. Okay, so the problem is is that young men account for a disproportionate amount of mortality and morbidity in the trauma scenario. So again, we start our assessment by the way in in dispatch it truly we do uh, the nature of the call what happened how many patients we have do, do we need uh, by the way do we need to contemplate our approach to the scene because again what happens if this is a busy interstate do i need to go down and exit and then come back up again these are all things that we have to start thinking about and again a dangerous scene uh we shouldn't be going into a dangerous scene and you remain, again, at a distance until the police arrive there and make sure that it is safe for which to go in. Uh, Reminds me of a funny meme. We're doing this around the Halloween time, and and uh, the one the one kid's dressed as a cop, and the one kid's dressed as a fireman. And the fireman was going in first. He said, isn't the cop supposed to clear the scene first? Right? Uh, so, again, that is, but we shouldn't be going into a dangerous area. That's the long and the short of it. Uh, again, inspect. Make sure that your uh, inspect equipment check working, and make sure everything's ready to go. You should have all this done the first thing when you get there in the morning. You you need to make sure everything is there, checked off, ready to go. Okay, and again, review assessment and cares. Again, uh, periodically do this. You should be reviewing. Don't read your protocol book on the way to a call. Oh man, you know you should know that already. Okay. Uh, so identify your scene hazards again. Locate all, locate and account for all patients. Okay, uh, if I've got an empty car seat in the car, or I've got things that are in a car that lead me to believe that there was another person, uh, start looking in the woods. Start checking out everything. Grab the tick, and that did not be tenderness, instability, crepitus. That would be the thermal imaging camera. Start scanning the environment, looking for people that that are have been thrown from the vehicle. Uh, not where they're supposed to be. Okay, so determine how the forces. Um, again, I've been preaching this all during this lecture series. Kinematics, kinematics, kinematics. Okay, how did the injury happen? Okay, so if I'm looking at this car, there's a lot of things that are setting off the red flags for me here. Okay, uh, uh, look at uh, uh, what is this here? Uh, the baby, you know, there, there's some sort of toy out here. You know, where is it? You know, there was a rollover, extensive damage. Again. Remember, there's not as much support up on the roof the structures of this, okay? Start looking for these clues as you approach the scene, okay? Um, now, again, the things that I want to know about, uh, especially in a penetrating trauma, what caused the penetration? Uh, was it a gunshot? If it was a gunshot wound, the nature of the weapon, the, the power and the profile, the, the distance, the, the angle of the barrel, uh, did it deflect off of anything? Did it hit something else? Uh, the head, central chest, after abdomens are most lethal in these cases. Head, neck, chest, I wonder why those are trauma alerts, huh? Okay, so organs affected and the extent of the injury. Again, assess it as the seriousness of the overall condition. And if you got more than one patient, 
you need to provide assessment and care accordingly. At that point, you're in a triage mode, okay? If you've got more patients and you got people to take care of them, we try to salvage the most, uh, again, the most salvageable ones is the one that we want to do, okay? Um, again, look for your hazardous material placards. Again, for the paramedic, a safety must be a lifestyle. Boy, is that statement ever so true, okay? Now, again, make sure you got your gloves on. Uh, by the way, other things that uh, make sure you, uh, again, keep that gown in your pocket. If you get to a scene and it's going to turn out to be messy, throw that gown on real quick. It really doesn't take that long. Uh, you, you know, get flop, flop into the into the suit, and then you're ready to go. Okay, uh, and you should have your eye protection on and your splatter protection. You got to have it, and then a mask is definitely advisable. Again, in our COVID era right now, I would say that the mask is a little bit more prevalent. But again, you should have all these things on, and again, eye protection. Don't get their spooge in your eyes. Okay, there's just no there's no need for it. Um, again, and, and identify the number of patients and estimate the number of resources that you're going to need. Okay? Okay, so if I get there and I've got you know four or five patients, I know I'm going to probably need four or five ambulances. Okay, uh, can you double up the BLS patients? Yeah, you probably can. But if they're serious patients, you're going to need an ambulance for each and every one of those patients. Okay. Um, now, um, determine the needs is for lighting. Again, on this scene as an example, they're having to put additional lighting in there. And again, you, you really need to to have these thought processes in mind, especially if you're going to have an extended scene. Uh, again, you should have some sort of command structure set up, incident command. And by the way, if you're one of the few paramedics, you shouldn't be the one in command. News flash. Okay. Now, again, if you've got 40 or 50 paramedics, hey, not a problem. You can take command of the scene. But if you're in the, one of the situation where maybe there's only seven paramedics in the county, you, your being in command of the scene is probably a really bad idea. Let somebody else command the scene, okay? Um, and again, that's a by field thing. Uh, your primary assessment, we've kind of preached upon this. Make sure your ABCs are taken care of, okay? Double check, do that rapid trauma survey, okay? Identify serious life threats, all right? Again, it takes less than 60 seconds usually to do that. Again, our, the only ones that we treat are airway issues anyway. Airway and uncontrolled bleedings, okay? So again, these are the, what you need to check for this. Your mental status. The start out is APU. By the way, everybody, APU is the eyes part of Glasgow Coma Score. Some of y'all missed that on your quiz. I was rather shocked about that. Now, um, mental status, again, um, I use the APU, guys. I don't go into these these extensive rules. If you want to use Glasgow Coma Score, by all means, do so. Uh, by the way, don't forget about spinal precautions. Again, take spinal precautions, especially if they can't answer your questions and there is uh, in any chance that there may be a spinal injury. Take these spinal precautions. Uh, again, uh, if the patient can talk clearly, they have the control of the open airway. If they can't, if they got uh, again, just because they can speak and talk clearly doesn't mean necessarily that they have a complete and patent airway. Make sure, double check that. Unconscious patient, I really want to make sure that they have a nice, wonderful airway. Okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, if they're unconscious, I, I should probably be thinking some sort of uh, at least a BLS ad air adjunct to start with, okay, and then again, reposition the head, neck, chill, remember, you're usually going to do a jaw thrust on the ones that are unconscious in a trauma situation, uh, if repositioning improves the air movement, considering you're inserting an oral airway, I think that's very important, if you've got an unconscious patient, again, you know, probably your oral airway, is your, your OPA is what you should be thinking at that point, uh, strider, snoring, gurgling, wheezing, uh, partial airway obstructions, and you need to handle that Fix that. Treat that. Okay. Uh, apply a pulse oximeter. Administer O2 supplementally. Uh, and then, again, make sure that the, the chest is going up and down. Make sure you don't have uh, any flailed chest there as well. If you do have a flailed chest, remember to stabilize it. And how do we stabilize it? With good positive pressure ventilations. There you go. Uh, rule out any type of diaphragmatic breathing, the percussion to the chest. Make sure that you, uh, you uh you cannot rule out attention pneumothorax. Uh, you need to de decompress it, okay? Again, worst case scenario, 10%, you might give them a pneumothorax, okay? But if you have the high index of suspicion of attention pneumothorax, go ahead and stick the chest, okay? Uh, quickly check the radio pulse for strength and regularity and rate. Again, radio pulse, they've got at least 80 blood pressure, okay? 
again, if they losing their pulses down there, they still have it at the neck. Again, they're a shock state. We need to start start thinking along that line of I need to get this patient going. I need to start shock care on this patient. Uh, the conclusion of the primary assessment, you need to determine whether you, the patient reverses a massive trauma assessment or a focused one. Hopefully, your rapid trauma assessment is what you did for your air, for your primary assessment. I think that both of those can be done at the same and, and should be done at the same time. Blunt trauma in cardiac arrest in pre-hospital setting is rare if ever survive, okay? Um, and I want to stress that point. Unfortunately, once they, if it's blunt trauma and they have arrested, your chances of resuscitating them are slim if ever. As a matter of fact, I, I, even the ones that I've gotten back, they didn't survive long. So keep that in mind, okay? Uh, you want to use the CUPS criteria, critical, unstable, potentially unstable, or stable, to help determine the patients of transport. Again, um, it's a good methodology which to use. Uh, red, red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, green is another one that's really extremely good, okay? Um, again, your blood patients in cardiac arrest, uh, they, they very rarely, if ever, survive. So again, your protocols should reflect that. Uh, a lot of the protocols today, if you have a traumatic patient that's in an arrest situation, most of the time they actually say that not to, or if you do work it, you work it two rounds there at the scene. Okay. Um, again, your secondary exam of these folks, again, uh, you start questioning, inspect, palpate, oscillate, and use your rapid uh, trauma assessment to do that. Uh, look, again, a nice detailed solid look of this patient okay and this should probably be done while transporting to the hospital more again uh, make sure that you question about other symptoms uh, remember that complaints are subjective and uh, try to when you say when they say things try to write it in their words is what they said uh, again inspect it again look for your skin color tone condition uh, look for deformities look for disruption in the skin uh, look uh, notice any uh, spasms or any type of pain, pain to the touch, and palpate for muscle tone as well. Oscillate, listen to the lung sounds. Hopefully you've done that, just make sure that you've got lung sounds. But again, abdominal oscillations are not merited in trauma. And again, usually, um, remember that if they're in a shock state, they usually shut down the mesentery anyway, so you're not gonna hear anything, okay? Uh, again, percuss, make sure, again, if you've got fluid, uh, in there, especially in the abdomen, you remember by tapping on it, it they're going to have an increased pain sensation. Uh, but when they're talking about the palpation, the percussion, they're talking about uh, the, the the lung fields here. Tap on those lung fields. If you're hearing a dull one, that usually means there's fluid or blood in there. And if they're hypersonic, uh, again, that high-pitched thunk, then it's probably going to be air in that pleural space. And, and again, hopefully you're, you're breaking out the needle after you hear that. Uh, again, suspect the patient has a serious injury uh, on a rapid trauma. Again, get them to a trauma center, get them to a trauma center, get them to a trauma center. Okay. Uh, look for your hemorrhages, head, neck, back, abdomen, pelvis, extremities. Uh, again, check distal function of each limb and then take a quick patient history, get a set of vital signs. That's your, your focus is again limited, more unlikely. It's usually patients that don't meet triage criteria. Um, Again, this is usually isolated injuries, isolated problems. Again, a quick patient history and get your vital signs, and then do a comprehensive check of this patient. Okay, um, I'm going to tell you why I'm not really a fan of the the focused trauma assessment. I think that you miss things. Uh, you really do need to go back and do a, a a rapid trauma assessment on these patients. I think by getting into that habit, you don't miss little things okay well he got an ankle injury scott yeah well of course that might be the case but again can we take the 60 seconds to really find that out all right so again a detailed physical exam of the patient again i think you guys all know how to do a good thorough detailed examination uh, again don't forget about your sample remember especially in like your scenario work uh, patients tend to go unconscious after about eight, nine minutes. The whole point of that is, is that you're doing these other assessments while you're talking to your patient and obtaining this past medical history. And don't just obtain a SAMP, okay? Get the last oral intake and events leading up, okay? That's the term sample, okay? You want to get that L&E in there, all right? 
Uh, especially if you're going to have to innovate that patient. I'd really like to know what I'm going to be fighting against. Uh, beer and chicken wings, uh, collard greens, whatever it might be. Okay. Get your baseline set of vitals. We usually do this at the end of the primary, uh, primary assessment or the end of the focused exam. Not the focus exam, but the end of the rapid trauma survey is usually when we want to get this. Um, I'm actually okay with pulse strength to start with, especially if you've got a really critical patient. Just remember, be thinking, I got to get a set of vital signs, okay? You really do need to get a baseline set of vital signs because that's what you're going to gauge how well your patient is or is not doing, okay? Um, again, and decide whether or not this patient needs to go to a trauma center or if it can go to the nearest emergency department, okay? We're kind of spoiled here. We've got trauma centers all around us, okay? Um, and so, uh, again, but does every patient need to go, any patient with trauma need to go to a trauma center? I think that answer is no. We need to save those trauma centers for the more serious patient. Now, those hospitals are probably going to tell you, oh, no, bring them all here. Okay, you're right. They're in the business of taking care of that stuff, okay? But, again, make that decision, uh, especially if you've got limited resources, okay? So, again, remember at the end of the rapid trauma assessment or, or the focus assessment, you need to make a decision whether to provide stabilization or to expedite the transport of the patient. All right, so again, make sure you get your Glasgow Coma Score, mechanism of injury, uh, all of these things need to be playing into a factor. Do they meet the state of Florida trauma alert criteria? Okay, do they meet, uh, do you think that that person needs a trauma surgeon? Okay, yeah, guess what? Newsflash, everybody. In the state of Florida, they got this category called green. The paramedic thinks that they need it. Okay, now again, you're kind of going out on a limb on that one. But I will tell you this, uh, by the way, most of the time, uh, go with your gut feeling because it's probably right, okay? Worst case scenario, you over triaged them. Oh, my Lord, guess what? We expect a little bit of that, all right? So don't be afraid about the over triage. Oh, the patient refusal. Oh, here we go. Um, again, minor traumas. Uh, yeah, uh, but again, it is the patient's right to refuse, and they can refuse just simple treatments. Uh, you, you need to... I found that the way that you stop a refusal is, is kind of simple. The way that you stop a refusal is, is you inform them. Hey, this might be happening to you. You know, you could be having this, 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 and this. And um, you really need to just make sure that they go to a physician to be medically evaluated. Um, and again, I think this is, again, a case-by-case -case basis. But when in doubt, they really need to be transported. All right. So, again, they have a right to do that, so uh, try to use the family members to help. Uh, stress uh, the patient should call for EMS signs and symptoms and document your, thir your refusal thoroughly, uh, especially if you don't agree with the refusal. Uh, guys, by the way, having a medical direction talk to the patient, again, if you haven't already explained it, they can probably explain it and explain it more. All right, reassessments every five minutes for the critically ill, every 15 for other patients. Uh, again, mental and airway breathing uh, circulation status checks. Uh, double check that APU, double check the Glasgow Coma Score, especially if it's changing, okay? Uh, reassess the vital signs of Glasgow Coma Score, recheck distal pulses, cap refill, and again, compare the findings with the baseline findings that you started with, okay? All right, we're going to start on the shock and multi-system trauma on the next video. I will talk to you all then.